Welcome to NFL Imperialism. You may have seen this concept floating around YouTube, but I wanted to put my own spin on it and hopefully improve it. Before we get started, I humbly ask that you take a moment to hit that subscribe button, hit that notification button. This is going to be a series, and this channel has some other videos as well, sports related, entertainment related. We do a lot here, trying to grow the audience. We appreciate the fact that you're here right now. We ask that you continue to stay with us. Please subscribe to the channel. Thank you. If you're interested in a full, thorough breakdown of how this imperialism works, please check out the first three minutes or so of the 1966 video, which is linked in the description below. Otherwise, we are ready to start. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the 1973 season. The Miami Dolphins ran it back and became the first team in the post-merger era to win back-to-back -back Super Bowls. They won that Super Bowl by defeating the Minnesota Vikings, who in this season got quarterback Fran Tarkenton back. They still ran back a pretty good defense, too. Will these teams play for Imperialism 8? Remember, the Washington Redskins are two-time defending champions. They're lurking as well. But according to our rankings, it's going to be someone else this season. The Dolphins ranked number one in 73, and there is a school of thought that this team was actually better than the 72 team, even though that team went undefeated. This team had a little bit more dominance in their victories, even though they dropped a couple of games. You'll see the Vikings there at fourth, Rams, Cowboys, Steelers round out the top five. The bottom five sees a lot of teams that are going to have some trouble to win this thing, but as we know, anything can happen. Let's go on and get this thing started. We dive right in with our first spin of the wheel for 1973. It's going to land on the Kansas City Chiefs. That arrow is going to go to the Northeast, and the proximity they have with the St. Louis Cardinals means that they're going to play this game, and it's going to be in St. Louis. The Chiefs trail 21-10 in the fourth quarter. It's third and 27. They're looking to get something done. Dawson is in the end zone. He gets sacked. That's a safety. Makes a 23-10. Dave Butts gets that play. On the ensuing free kick, the Cardinals methodically drive it down. Jim Hart stands back, finds tight end Jackie Smith. Right outside the end zone, he takes it in for the touchdown. The Cardinals brought an offensive unit into this game, very efficient. Win the game 30-10. By name, it's a bit of an upset, but the Cardinals aren't too bad during this era. So, looking at the map, the state of Missouri, once shared, no longer is. The Cardinals take it over, knock the Chiefs out of the game, and expand their land. With our first team out, we're going to get back onto this wheel. Gave it a nice spin there, and it's going to land on the Raiders. They get picked on early quite a bit. That goes up to the northeast a little bit, but with the proximity to the 49ers, that's going to be the game. Raiders at Niners. The Raiders lead by 18 points in the fourth quarter, looking to put this game away. The handoff goes to Charlie Smith. Goes off left tackle. The Niners defense nowhere to be seen. That's an easy touchdown. 31-6 is the score at this point. The 49ers pretty much fell apart at this point. 45-6 is your final score. The Raiders, who have had some trouble winning games in Imperialism, get on the board here in 1973 in emphatic fashion. Northern California belongs to them. The 49ers are out. The Raiders, maybe this is the year they make some noise. They go on. Back to the wheel we go. It is going to be selecting the Buffalo Bills. The arrow is going to take them slightly southwest into Philadelphia. So we had a game in the central. We had a game out west. Now we're going to have a game out east. Buffalo Bills at Philadelphia Eagles. Late in the third quarter, the Eagles trail 17-14. Pitch goes to fullback Norm Bulosh. They seem to have him at the line, but he will not go down. Breaks all sorts of tackles, gets into the end zone. The Eagles, who led 14-0, gave up 17 straight points, now take the lead. Buffalo is now on the comeback trail. It's 4th and 10 from just inside midfield. Joe Ferguson drops back, looks for a receiver, J.D. Hill, incomplete. Turnover on downs, but the Bills will get it back. It is now fourth and five, and the pressure comes, and that's a sack. The Eagles will try for a field goal here. 
46 yards from Tom Dempsey that somehow misses. That looked perfectly aligned. Buffalo will get fourth down one more time, this time back at the 40. Ferguson drops back, throws to tight end Paul Seymour. Not, that's not going to get it done. Bills will take this game. Final score 21 to 17. Looking at the map here, now we are in the Northeast, as we mentioned. The entire state of New York, including Long Island, will now fall to the Eagles as they expand their territory. We go in search of our next game, and to that end, the wheel is going to give us the Chicago Bears. Arrow is going to take them slightly northeast. We're actually going to get our first expansion for 1973. The state of Indiana will now belong to the Chicago Bears. We go back to the wheel to see that we're going to get the Miami Dolphins. That sound you hear is the fear of the Atlanta Falcons. The arrow, ooh, photo finish. Look at that from the center of the Dolphins logo. That is just going to hit the southernmost tip of Alabama. The Falcons are temporarily spared. The Dolphins are going to expand into Alabama. And we had to marbleize the logo to get it as close to the center as we could. After back-to-back -back expansions, we will try this wheel one more time. It's going to get past the Falcons to the Patriots. Arrow takes them southwest, so as is common, the Patriots are going to start off with an expansion. They're going into the state of Connecticut, which does connect them a little bit more with the rest of the map. That's now three consecutive expansions, but this wheel is going to barely give us the Cleveland Browns. They're surrounded. We have to have a game here. That goes northwest, but not quite northwest enough to hit the Bears territory. That's going into Detroit. Browns at Lions coming up next. The Lions lead 21-14 in the fourth quarter in a back-and-forth affair. Quarterback Greg Landy drops back, throws it to Charlie Sanders, who turns on the Jets, gets to the 20, avoids a tackle, avoids the entire defense. That is a tight end, folks. A Hall of Fame tight end but a tight end nonetheless, making that incredible play. Cleveland gets the ball back and grind it down to the 20-yard line, looking to try to get back into this game. The handoff goes to Brown. That is not Jim Brown, mind you. That is Ken Brown. We're a little bit too far into the future for Jim, but that is a nice run. Jim Brown looking type run. Touchdown, 28-21. The Lions recover the onside kick, though. Take it down to the 13-yard line. Greg Landry throws it to receiver Larry Walton, making it 35-21. That will put the game away. In fact, the Lions went ahead and tacked on a touchdown on defense for a final score of 42-21. The second straight season, Detroit and Cleveland have had a high-scoring game. That was won by Detroit. So looking at the map here, Northern Ohio is no more for the Cleveland Browns. The Lions take over that territory and they expand their land. Our next game will eliminate our fifth team. This wheel is going to stop right before the Falcons. That's going to be the Baltimore Colts. The arrow is going to take them to the northeast slightly, and that will just hit the northern corner of Delaware. So it's a small expansion, but an expansion nonetheless for the Colts. We'll give this wheel another go, and it's going to land on the New York Jets. The arrow is going to take them to the northwest. That's going to hit the Eagles territory. That means the Eagles are going to be up for the second time. And for the fifth game out of five, we're going to have an interconference matchup. The Jets' Mike Adamley receives a second half kickoff. He's making some moves. Gets to midfield. Gets around two different guys. He's getting that deep. They're going to try to tackle him. But he breaks free. Can he get in? Not quite. But on the very next play, Emerson Bruiser gets in for the touchdown. Jets lead 21-14. The Eagles are coming back, though. The handoff goes to Tom Sullivan. Up the middle. Gets away from a tackler, and he takes off. They're not going to be able to catch him, I don't think. Uh, well, they did catch him, but he still scored. Tied at 21. This is not a replay. This is a different Tom Sullivan run. This time, they don't get him at all. 28-21 Eagles. The Jets are coming right back from the 14-yard line. They hand off up the middle to John Riggins, and he breaks some tackles, and he gets into the end zone. This game has gone back and forth. You're not getting a lot of aerial play, but the ground game is keeping it exciting. 
So it's 28-27 pending the extra point here for the Jets. This is quite the shootout we got going here. The Jets are going for two. Oh, maybe they think their defense can make a stop here. But they're going to go for the two. The handoff is going to go to Riggins right up the middle. The Jets now lead. But the Eagles come back. It's second down. Gabriel's actually dropping back the pass, and he throws it in the end zone. Tight end Charlie Young with the touchdown. The Eagles kick the extra point, so it's a six-point game. The Jets get it down. It's fourth and ten from the 22. 33 seconds to go. Al Woodall throws to Riggins, and he just gets the first down. But that clock is ticking. Tick, tick, tick. We're under eight seconds, seven seconds, six seconds. They get the play call in. This is going to be it. In the shotgun from the 12. Woodall fires to Riggins. It's a terrible pass. The Eagles are going to hold on to win this heart stopper of a game. 35-29. An interesting final score. All that work. The Eagles are going to take away the Jets land, which is just southern New Jersey. But it's their second win in 1973. And they are still in the game. We're going to run through a few expansions here. Wheel selects the Chargers. Arrow takes them east. So they're going to expand from Southern California into Arizona. Another spin of the wheel here will give us the Broncos, which is an automatic expansion at this point. That's going north. So they will grab Wyoming. The next spin of the wheel will give us the Saints, just barely. Arrow's going to head slightly northwest. That's going to be a game here. Another interconference game. Saints at Oilers. We've got a low-scoring game between two not-so-great teams. The Saints do lead 7-6. That is Archie Manning. You may have heard of his uh, family, the extended family. Touchdown pass goes to Bob Newland. That's going to give the Saints a 14-6 lead. That's going to be our final score. The Saints successfully invade Houston. So looking at the map, the southeastern portion of Texas will now belong to the New Orleans Saints. And the NFC is doing a very good job so far in their games against the AFC. 1973 barrels forward with another wheel spin. That's going to be the Broncos, so we're going to expand slightly to the northwest. That's going to bypass Utah, and the Broncos will be expanding into Idaho. So we'll try the wheel one more time. It's a big hefty spin there. That's going to land on the Pittsburgh Steelers. The arrow is going to take them to the northwest. Now, whether that hits the Lions territory directly or not, it will get there eventually. Since the two teams are bordering each other, that's going to be a game. Steelers at Lions. The Steelers are in total control, up 17-3 in the third quarter from midfield. Greg Landry drops back, throws to Charlie Sanders, beats the defender, gets past them, and he drags them down to the two-yard line. The next play was a sack, so here on second and goal, Greg Landry will hand it off to Alti Taylor, gets around the corner, gets through a guy, gets into the end zone. The Lions are starting to come back here with the extra point. They're only going to be down 17-10. On the ensuing kickoff, this is John Rouser of the Steelers. And uh, he looks like, oh, he gets stripped by Lem Barney. The Lions pick it up, get it to the 3-4 yard line. Very next play, Alti Taylor again. And just like that, the Steelers went from up 17-3 to three to tied at 17. The Lions get the ball back but are forced to punt. Once again, it's John Rouser. Will he make up for that fumble? He might. He gets it to about midfield. He fumbles again. Oh, no. The Lions pick it up. Special teams dooming the Steelers. This will lead to a 44-yard field goal attempt by Earl Mann. The kick is up. It's good. 2017, there's still time, though. The Steelers are at midfield. Terry Bradshaw with the play action. Throws to Barry Pearson. It's intercepted again here by Lem Barney. His second takeaway of the second half. He's not going down. That will actually tick the clock down to zero. The Lions make the comeback in the second half to win this game 
20 to 17. So the Pittsburgh Steelers ranked in the top five coming into 1973, go to Detroit and lose. The Lions will pick up the Steelers territory and in our seven interconference games that we've had, the NFC is six and one. Coming off all that excitement, we'll go ahead and spin the wheel one more time, and that is going to stay with the Falcons. The arrow heads to the west. That would have been an expansion, but the Dolphins picked up Alabama, so the Falcons now once again have to go to Miami to play the Dolphins. Atlanta's not rolling over. They're only down 10, and they're threatening to the score here late in the first half. Bob Lee fires the Jim Mitchell that is intercepted by Dick Anderson. Streaking in front of the tight end to make the play. He's got the speed. They can't get it. I don't know why that guy's not getting him. He can't get him. It's a touchdown for the Dolphins. Incredible turnaround. A 14-point swing. That makes it 24-7. From there, the Dolphins go into cruise control and win this game by a final score of 31-10. So not only did the Dolphins increase the AFC's record now to 2-6, but they also now are 8-0 against the Falcons. They get this win, they take over the Falcons' territory, and as they have done in each season prior to this one, they enter isolation. As more and more teams get eliminated, we go back to the wheel. This is going to be just barely hitting the Cardinals. So they are up, the arrow goes west, Nobody there to play, but they will expand into the state of Kansas. That ends the Broncos' isolation. We spin it one more time to see that we will get the two-time defending imperialism champion Washington Redskins. Arrow goes north. They're going to be going to Baltimore, but this is not a very good Baltimore team. So Washington gets a favorable start in defending its championship. No kidding. Nothing to see here. Tough scene for the Colts. Washington got all over them. Winning with a final score of 52-7. to So the NFC beats the AFC one more time. That's 7 out of 9. The Redskins will take over Baltimore's territory, which includes Maryland and Delaware, expanding their own land. Hopefully our next game is a little closer than 45 points. It's going to involve the Lions. They're surrounded. They're going to have to play somebody. The arrow goes to the northwest, and because that Lion logo is tucked into the southwest corner, that will hit the northeast corner of the Bears. So we're getting our first intra-conference game of 1973. NFC North rivals, actually NFC Central rivals from 1973, the Lions at the Bears. The Lions lead 21-7 late in the third quarter. From inside the 15-yard line, Greg Landry fires to the end zone, and there he is again. Charlie Sanders making the catch, giving the Lions a 28-7 lead. Now, later in the game, the Bears have scored a touchdown and gotten the two, so it's 28-15. Play-action pass from Bobby Douglas floats it to Earl Thomas. That's a catch. First and goal, now it's second and goal. The Lions call an audible on defense. The Bears drop back the pass, flip it to fullback Jim Harrison. That's a touchdown. So this is getting interesting now. The Lions were up by 21, now they're only up six. Here comes the onside kick. If the Bears can get this, it'll be a great finish. They can't. Alty Taylor recovers. The Bears sure made it interesting entering the fourth quarter down 21. But the Lions hold on, get the 28-22 victory. So for the third time in 1973 imperialism, the Lions have won a game. This time they went on the road to do so. They take over the Bears' land, and this is the second straight season they've won three games. Let's see if this season they can't keep up that momentum. Ten teams have now been eliminated as we go back to the wheel. It's super close. Saints and Broncos, it's the Saints. Arrow's going to take them to the Northwest, so the Saints are going to have to go into Dallas to play the Cowboys. This will be their second invasion into Texas. This is a taller order. Can they do it again? Um, no, they can't. Saints fans, that's not a misprint. Dallas wins 67 to nothing. 
forced seven turnovers, blocked two punts, scored three defensive or special teams touchdowns, and had two safeties. Let's get away from this. Let's go look at the map. The Saints weren't able to take over Dallas' territory. It'll go the other way. The Cowboys take over Louisiana and the rest of Texas. Back at it now. Hopefully we don't have any games like that anymore. This wheel is going to land on the Giants. There's no need to spin the arrow. They're surrounded by the Eagles. So they're going to travel to Philadelphia and play that game. The Eagles lead 17-3 in the third quarter. Roman Gabriel steps up in the pocket, throws to Charlie Young, makes the catch, breaks the tackle, gets into the end zone for the touchdown. This play notwithstanding, the Eagles control this game by running the ball all over the Giants. Final score is 31-9. The Eagles win and knock the Giants out. The Giants are entering their wilderness period here. It's going to be a while before they're good. Basically the arrival of Lawrence Taylor and then the subsequent arrival of Bill Parcells. All that said, the Giants are off the map now. The Eagles take over the rest of New Jersey and now have a nice chunk of land in the Northeast after notching their third victory. Off to the wheel we go one more time. This will land on the San Diego Chargers. The arrow is going to take them just about directly east. Nobody there, that's the state of New Mexico. So the Chargers are going to expand, and now they're going to be touching the Broncos and the Cowboys. We give the wheel another go. This is going to be landing directly on the Rams. Arrow's going to take them slightly to the southeast, just southeast enough to guarantee they land in the Chargers territory. This will be a matchup between the second highest and the second lowest teams in our rankings. The Chargers O-line is simply no match for the Rams defensive line. Here on the first possession for the Chargers, Jack Youngblood breaks through the line, strip sacks, quarterback Dan Fouts, picked up for a touchdown by Dave Elmendorf, and before the Rams offense has seen the field, they lead this game 7-0, it was a blowout, 40 to nothing was your final score. The Chargers were okay in the second and third quarters, but first and fourth, not so much. So this extended battle for Southern California ends up going to the Rams, who now also pick up the states of Arizona and New Mexico in knocking the Chargers out of the game and expanding their land. With half the teams eliminated, we're going to do a quick expansion run here. The Cowboys go northeast. They're going to grab the state of Arkansas. The next spin of the wheel will bring us the Raiders. They're going to head east. They're going to grab their future home state. That is the state of Nevada. Wheel comes by one more time. We'll get the Lions. That's going to go southwest. That's just going to hit the state of Kentucky. And the wheel's now going to give us the Bengals. And they're going to head to the southwest, which basically means they're going to have to play the Lions. So, Bengals at Lions. The Lions going for their fourth win. This is our first time at all hearing from the Bengals. The Lions find themselves in a familiar position, down by 13 in the third quarter. The handoff's going to go to Alti Taylor. He's been their man this whole time. He does it again. And now it looks like the Lions are trying to make another comeback. They did it against the Steelers. Trying it now against the Bengals. They're down 20 to 14, and they have the Bengals here at a third and 11. We are now into fourth quarter. They're going to hand it off to Essex Johnson, and he's going to break a tackle, get away, and there he goes. Not a whole lot of speed, but certainly enough to make a big play right there. Now the Bengals are knocking on the door, trying to put this away. It's going to be play action. Anderson throws to the end zone. It's intercepted. It's Lem Barney once again. What might the Lions do here now? They're facing fourth and four. They're going to go for it. The pitch to Steve Owens goes nowhere. Can the Bengals finally put this away? From the 24, Ken Anderson looks to tight end Bob Trump. He makes the play, gets it into the end zone for the touchdown. That's going to squash the Lions' comeback attempt. They score a touchdown very, very, very late to make final score 
27-21 Cincinnati. Got to look at this like a little bit of an upset here. The Lions had won three games already. Bengals taking the field for the first time. But they take their little area of land there in southern Ohio and expand it all the way through what the Lions have taken time to build up over these few games. The Bengals look like the strongest team right now in the Midwest. Want to run through another little quick mini expansion run here? The Eagles will head to the Northeast and take the state of Vermont. Now the wheel's going to land on the Eagles again. No, the Raiders. They're going to go east and they're going to expand into Utah. And now the wheel's going to land on the Broncos. That's going to go straight south. That's not an expansion. That's going to be a game. They're going to have to go to L.A. to play the Rams. The Chargers did not fare well against the Rams. Let's see how the Broncos do. Denver's hanging in there and then some. It's tied at 14 late in the first half. The Broncos drop back the pass. Quarterback Charlie Johnson finds tight end Riley Odoms, and he is going to get into the end zone. That's a touchdown, 21-14 Broncos. They're going to take that lead into halftime. The Rams are coming back, though. From just inside the 10-yard line, the pitch goes to fullback Jim Bertelson, and he gets into the end zone for the touchdown. Jim Bertelson, I should say. That's going to tie the game up at 21. The Rams are driving again. Now they're inside the 10 on a third down. The handoff goes to Bertelson. He's taken down. They're forced to settle for a field goal. Now the Rams force a Broncos punt, but it's a direct snap to Floyd Little, and he drags for a first down. Trying to take advantage now on this drive. They're going to hand it off to Otis Armstrong up the middle, and he fumbles the ball. Ball's bouncing around. It's scooped up by the Broncos, and that's Haven Moses, and he's taking off. They're going to try to catch him. He spins away. He spins away again. What a fluky touchdown oh my goodness the Broncos fumble scoop it up and run it in 72 yards well the Rams looking to make this comeback they're down 28 24 John Hadel drops back throws it to Lawrence McCutcheon he's trying to break free and he fumbles the Broncos pick it up folks that's the upset right there the Broncos Invade Los Angeles and pick up a huge win. Looking at this map, the Rams were looking like they were going to be a team to beat. But now that the Broncos have defeated them and taken them off the map, they look like they might have the most land in the U.S. right now. We're going to revisit the wheel here, and it's going to give us the Eagles, already 3-0. They're going to head slightly to the southwest. That is going to hit... Washington's territory so the defending two-time champions will now defend their home field against the surging Eagles. Philly trails 10-7 in the fourth quarter but they're on the doorstep. The handoff to Norm Bulosh goes in for the touchdown. The Eagles now lead this game in the fourth quarter 14-10 but Washington has a chance to make a comeback here. They're at the 25-yard line. The handoff goes to Dwayne Thomas off the bench and that ball is out backup safety Al Coleman forces the fumble the Eagles recover a few plays later on the goal line Bulosh once again for the touchdown and this one is gonna be over the Eagles win this game 21 to 10 knocking out the Redskins the two-time defending champions Snapping their 15-game winning streak, the Eagles now are moving on. Looking at the map, once again, they're not picking up a gigantic piece of land. But the victory is what counts, and this team is 4-0 here in 1973. Could they be the dark horse to win it all? Only 10 teams remain here in 1973. Imperialism, the Bengals are called up into action. That's going to be a photo finish to the southwest. That is just going to hit the Cardinals' territory. It looked like, at first, an expansion to Tennessee. But we're going to get a game here. A couple of kind of underdogs here, but it's going to be nice to see them on the field against each other. Bengals 
at Cardinals. The Cardinals methodically march the ball down the field to the goal line. The handoff goes to Terry Metcalf. That is the father of Eric Metcalf. You may remember him. This gives the Cardinals a insurmountable lead, potentially, 28-13. Now, let's not count the Bengals out quite yet. There's a minute and a half left. Play action pass. Ken Anderson throws to Isaac Curtis. Makes a diving catch. They're inside the 10-yard line. Minute 13 to go. And it's going to be play action again. And it's to Curtis again. Okay. So the Bengals get this touchdown. That makes it 28-19. They're going to go for the two-point conversion here. They get it. They'll be within seven. The snap, the handoff to Booby Clark, and he almost gets in, but he's stuffed. So here's the onside kick attempt. The Cardinals can't land on it. The Bengals get it. All right, let's see what they do. First play after the onside kick. Anderson drops back, holds it, throws to Isaac Curtis, and he is going to get into the end zone again. Oh my goodness, we should not have written the Bengals off. They will go for the two again and get it this time. I don't know why they went for two, but 28-27. Here comes another onside kick. Can they get it again? No, that's Wayne Mulligan for the Cardinals landing on it. What an exciting ending to a game that looked like it was over. The Cardinals snap a four-game losing streak for home teams, winning the game 28-27. So here on the map now, the Bengals did a good job building up territory, but the Cardinals are going to swoop in and take it all. And they look like they could be a dark horse along with the Eagles in this thing. We're getting closer to crowning an Imperialism champion for 1973. Here's one of the contenders, the Cowboys. That's going to go to the Northeast. That's going to hit the St. Louis Cardinals. So the Cardinals just coming off that big win against the Bengals. We'll have to defend their land again, this time against Dallas. The Cardinals fall apart in the first quarter, going down 14-0 early. Return man Gary Hammond is stripped by Charlie Waters, picked up by Mark Washington. He's trying to get into the end zone. He's held up at the two-yard line, but he breaks free and gets in. Dallas jumps out to a 21-0 first quarter lead, and they're able to coast from that point on. A 40 to nothing victory, a second shutout for the Cowboys, and the Cardinals, who were looking like a Cinderella-type team, are now out. Looking at the map here, it is without question, as the Cowboys take over the Cardinals' territory, that they have the largest piece of land in the U.S. and may have just established themselves as this season's favorites. We've reached the virtual quarterfinals here with eight teams remaining. The wheel selects the Broncos. The arrow is going to take them to the southeast. That's going to take them into Texas, which of course is still Cowboys territory. Can the Cowboys maintain their dominance against what we can fairly call weaker competition? Let's find out. Denver did fight back after falling behind 28-0, but Dallas now has the ball up 28-13. The draw play to Calvin Hill hurdles, gets to about the 11-yard line, breaks a tackle, will get into the end zone for the touchdown. Give credit to the Broncos. They didn't completely roll over. In fact, they actually added a touchdown after this. Final score of this game was 35-21. The Cowboys will win. And looking at the map here, they're really taking over most of the country. The Broncos accumulated a nice chunk of land, but Dallas now owns that land. And with just a few teams remaining, Dallas owns more than half of everything that's been claimed. There are still three teams that we have not seen on the field and two we haven't heard from at all. One of those is the Packers, and the arrow's going to go west, and the other one was the Vikings. So we haven't heard from these two teams at all, and now they're going to play each other, and it's going to be in Minnesota. The Vikings carry a 17-0 lead into the fourth quarter. That's Fran Tarkinson in the shotgun. Holds it, fires in the end zone. John Gilliam for the touchdown. The Vikings are going to take a 24-0 lead. Their defense isn't quite what it has been, but it's still very good. A 27-0 final score. In contrast, the Packers' offense isn't that good. So these two teams that we're just now hearing from go at it. Minnesota wins. Green Bay is out. Minnesota picks up that land. And they're still in the game here as we get closer and closer to the end. 
Just five games remain until we crown a new Imperialism champion. The wheel is going to choose the Raiders. It's going to go to the Southwest. That normally would send them into the Pacific Ocean, but given their current location and how much land the Cowboys have picked up, that's going to be our next game. Raiders at Cowboys. The Raiders won't be bullied by the Cowboys, but they are settling for too many field goals. Longtime veteran George Blanda makes his third field goal of the day. It's 9-0. Dallas gets it down first and goal. The pitch to Calvin Hill stopped. Second and goal. They try the pitch again. Cuts it in. Stopped. Third down. The Raiders come after it and he stopped. Dallas will settle for the field goal here. Make it a one-score game. It'll be 9-3. It's low scoring, but it's been exciting. The Raiders now have the ball. Try to run the clock out and win this game. 9-3. The handoff goes to Marv Hubbard and Charlie Waters. He is a fumble-forcing machine. Gets that ball out, and the Cowboys are in striking range. Very next play. Play action pass. Staubach drops back. Floats it up. And who else? Bob Hayes has been making plays for the Cowboys for the last few seasons. Diving catch. Touchdown. The all-important extra point here for the lead. Tony Fritch puts it in. Dallas did nothing most of this game. They now lead 10-9. The Raiders have crossed midfield at second and five. They only need a field goal. That's a bad pass. Lucky that wasn't intercepted. Here on third down, Stabler's going to drop back again. Surveys, throws to Fred Bolitnikoff. Incomplete. Fourth down. You need at least five yards for the first. They're going to run it to Hubbard, and he's stuffed. Oh, no. Well, Dallas... Comes from behind, wins it in the fourth quarter, 10-9, low scoring, but certainly edge of your seat, exciting. So looking at the map now, the Raiders, they've gotten a lot farther than they have any other season, but they're out. Dallas takes their land, they look to be dominant, but take a look at the southeastern corner of the map. Let's not forget about our reigning two-time Super Bowl champion Miami Dolphins. In the meantime, Dallas certainly looks very powerful. Getting down to the nitty-gritty here, the wheel's going to give us the Miami Dolphins a guaranteed expansion. That is going to go to the Northwest. So, they're going to take the state of Tennessee and their period of isolation has ended. We go back to the wheel in the hopes of finding our next game. That's going to get into the Eagles. The arrow is going to take them to the southwest. That's going to take them into the rest of Pennsylvania, which, of course, is under Cowboys control. The Eagles and the Cowboys. The Cowboys have the lead, the ball, and the momentum after trailing earlier. Handoff goes to Calvin Hill. He bursts through the middle. 30-yard touchdown. Shortly thereafter, he gets another touchdown. And again, the Eagles were leading this game, but the Cowboys decided to take it over. That touchdown makes it 38-14. The Eagles made it closer by the end. 44-28 is your final score. The Cowboys keep winning. The Eagles did great. They won four games, but they're off the map now. The Cowboys take over their territory, and we're going to be down to our final four teams. And with that final four, we get this spin of the wheel. It's going to be landing on the Dolphins. They might play. That's a photo finish, and look at that. It seemed most likely they would go into Dallas's territory or hit South Carolina, but they catch that corner of North Carolina, and they get an expansion and get to stay off the field. We'll go back to the wheel again, and it's going to very clearly land on the Patriots. The arrow goes south, and that's going to hit Long Island, and that's Cowboys territory. So the Patriots are going to have to take the field. It's going to be in Dallas. Let's see how this goes. We've gotten used to the Patriots getting rolled over, but here they're going to take the lead if they can get a touchdown. And that was a dangerous throw by Jim Plunkett right there, but it got in there. Touchdown to the running back, John Ashton. The Patriots lead. Still in the first half here, the Cowboys from the 10-yard line. The pitch goes to Calvin Hill. 
The Patriots seem stronger defensively against the pass than they do against the run. Hill's been hurting them to this point, and he gets this touchdown here. So Dallas reclaims the lead 14-10. They now lead 17-10. The Patriots don't go away, methodically driving down the field. Plunkett goes to the end zone to Reggie Rucker. He makes the catch. That's going to be a tie ball game here after the extra point. 17-16. Here is that extra point. And the Cowboys break through the line. Oops, don't want to assume anything. They block it. So they actually maintain a one-point lead. The Patriots drop the defense back. A pitch to Calvin Hill. I mean, they're having trouble stopping the run. Then they bring the defense back. Don't quite understand that. Hill gets into the end zone once again. They will make the extra point here. 24-16, but the Patriots aren't going away. They are holding on to the ball, methodically moving it down the field. But once they get in the red zone, they're firing it. That is Reggie Rucker again. Makes the catch, makes the move. Gets into the end zone. 24-22. You would imagine they're going to go for two points here. But sometimes the AI doesn't, doesn't know what to do. And again, that's one of them. Remember, it's a 30-year-old game. You're going to see this problem in Madden games, too, where teams don't take timeouts. But they kick the extra point. It's not over. It's 24-23. The Cowboys are 3rd and 18. The Patriots' defense has stepped up. Dangerous, dangerous play. Lucky to get away with a punt. The Patriots now have it, 3rd and 6. Bob Lilly breaks through the line, strip sacks. Jim Plunkett, it's picked up by Larry Cole. They tack on a touchdown. The Patriots put up quite a fight here in Dallas. But the Cowboys are going to escape with a 31-23 victory. So again, the last few seasons, we've seen the Patriots not even get highlights when we're doing these imperialisms because they're getting beat by so much. Here they get a bit of an extended highlight. They deserved it. Couldn't quite pull it off, though. So at the end of the day, the Cowboys will take over their land and are just drawing a line right through the sand between last season's Super Bowl competitors. The Vikings and the Dolphins are still alive with the Cowboys right between them. And indeed, with that setup, the Cowboys are going to have to play in the next game. There's no way the Dolphins and the Vikings can play each other before the championship. That lands on the Vikings. It goes slightly southeast. That's going to hit Iowa. It's going to be an expansion. We'll try this again. The wheel's going to get to the Cowboys, passing the Dolphins. Arrow is going to take them to the northwest, which also goes into Iowa. But since Minnesota just claimed that... It's going to be a game, Cowboys at Vikings. That also means that the Dolphins were able to ride their isolationism all the way to the championship game. And the season in which they did it is when they're ranked number one and the reigning Super Bowl champions. The Dolphins await the winner of our next game. The Vikings lead 10-0 in the fourth quarter. The Cowboys desperately need a stop here. Ferenc Harkinson fires a deep to John Gilliam. They left him alone, and he's able to outrun everybody into the end zone for a massive touchdown. That gives the Vikings a 17-0 lead. The Cowboys aren't quite going away. They've gotten it down inside the 30. They pitch it to Calvin Hill, and it seems like the Cowboys might be better off picking up chunk plays, running the ball, than they do throwing it. So that's a touchdown. It's 17-7 here with the extra point. The Vikings are going to get the ball back, but the Cowboys force a punt. And Bob Hayes is back to receive. He's going to try to return this from out of the end zone. They get him down. They're going to call that a safety. So 19-7 is your final score. Looked like he may have gotten out, but I don't think it was going to change the result. Vikings win. Cowboys are out. And after all that, we have our championship matchup. And it's the same matchup as Super Bowl VIII. The Vikings, who only won two games to get here, and the Dolphins, who only won one. But it seems like we got maybe the two best teams are very close to it into this game. All we're going to do now is spin the wheel to find out who's attacking and who's defending. And here is that spin of the wheel. It's going to land on the Vikings. So they're going to travel to South Beach to play the Dolphins. Super Bowl 8 is now Imperialism 8. Who will win it all?
We're tied at seven in the second quarter. The Dolphins are on the Vikings 40 yard line. The offensive line holds up great. The deep pass to Marlon Briscoe. He gets it down to about the one yard line. Very next play, Mercury Morris gets it into the end zone. The Dolphins break the gridlock here. They lead 14 to seven. Later on in the second quarter, they're leading 17 to seven. The Vikings are now driving. They have time to get something done here. Tarkinson looks to get the ball to Carroll Dale and it's intercepted. That is corner Charlie Babb getting in front of the play. The Dolphins are going to turn that into this 48-yard field goal attempt by Garo Yepremian. Buries it. 20-7 is our halftime score. Coming out of the second half, the Vikings got the ball, couldn't do anything. Greasy drops back from the 35. Again, the line holds up great. Marlon Briscoe again makes the catch. This time, he gets into the end zone. The Vikings are up against it now. 27-7. Here on the ensuing kickoff, Chuck Foreman back to receive. Looking to get the jump start here, but he's held up immediately. And then he fumbles. Nick Buonaconti forces it. The Vikings have fallen apart here. The Dolphins will pick that up, run it into the end zone. That's Manny Fernandez. It's only at this point the Vikings started to wake up a little bit. 34-7, they, they made it look a little closer by the end. 37-21 in a game very reminiscent of last season's imperialism, one that the Dolphins were on the losing end of against Washington. So here we are. It is the United States of Miami. The Dolphins own the United States. Last season, as the undefeated 1972 champions, they couldn't get it done. This season, they do, and they join the 1966 Packers as only the second team to win both the Super Bowl and imperialism in the same season. As we review the real results from the 1973 season against imperialism, well, not much to see here. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss, the Dolphins defeated the Vikings in both Super Bowl VIII and Imperialism VIII. Taking a look now at the winning 1973 Miami Dolphins roster, on offense it's easy to go ahead and take a look at the skill position players, but that offensive line right there, Jim Langer, Bob Kuchenberg, Larry Little, Wayne Moore, Norm Evans really did the job. Everybody's been having trouble with that incredible Vikings defensive line and the Dolphins held them to bay. The defense was also excellent. Everybody tends to know about that starting safety combination, Jake Scott and Dick Anderson. But from top to bottom, these guys are all super talented, highly above average players. Nick Buonaconti is in the Hall of Fame. A lot of the guys surrounding him aren't. They're in the Hall of Very Good, if nothing else. But this defense did just as much to help this team as the offense did. Taking a look at the scores from 1973, with a few notable exceptions, none more obvious than that Cowboys 67 to nothing victory, a vast majority of these games went into the fourth quarter undecided. Here in the second half, we see that the Cowboys really started taking control before they ran into the Vikings in Minnesota. Then we got to the championship game in Miami, where of course the Dolphins got the victory. 12 of the 26 teams in 1973 were able to pull off a victory. The Lions, Eagles, and Cowboys all pulled off more than two, which is more than the Dolphins did in winning the whole thing. The Cowboys reclaimed their spot at the top of the overall rankings with 22 victories now. The Redskins were the first to win a 20th game, but then the Cowboys went on their run. The Lions have 13 victories, more than any other team that has yet to win imperialism. The 70s are starting to get a little bit harder for them, so hopefully they didn't miss their chance. Some closer games meant a little bit more highlights, which also meant a slightly longer video. So if you've gotten this far, I thank you so very much. That was 1973 imperialism. We should be due in a few days now to get 1974 up and running. For those of you who have missed any video to this point, all of them are posted in the description down below. And if you're watching this at some point in the future, all future videos are also posted. Anything that's been posted is down there. In the meantime, then, if you could please like the video, share it with some friends, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon for notifications. It really helps us grow. 
We've got a lot going on at the channel. This is our major series, but we have other videos, not just in sports, but in the entertainment world as well. So if you don't mind my saying so once again, thank you. Before we get out of here, we want to take one last look at the conquering Miami Dolphins of 1973, Super Bowl VIII, and Imperialism VIII champions, owners of the United States of America. Thank you all so very much. Hope you have an awesome day. We will catch you next time here at CCC Productions.